Is this on? Okay. Um, anyway, my name is Ella Travis, and I'm here to tell you about Valmont. There is always a before. Before I mention a local pivotal event in the summer of 1863, here are a few befores. Gold had been discovered at Gold Run in January of 1859, two years before Colorado became a territory. And from parts of Kansas and Nebraska territories, the dividing line of which is the 40th parallel, now known as Baseline Road. And one year before Boulder County was established, 10 years before a railroad would reach Boulder, and 13 years before statehood. The year is 1863. The place, Colorado Territory. The times, turbulent. The economic situation depressed. From the first hundred years, that um, was a book about, about Valmont. The times were full of tribulation. The Civil War was in progress. Now, two months since the Battle of Gettysburg, brother was fighting brother. The Indians were taking advantage of the time and were interfering with travel along the few roads being used and marauders caused much consternation. People were leaving Colorado faster than they were arriving, for many did not have the courage and patience to face the difficulties in seeking minerals or to live on the frontier. Morals were at a low ebb. The church had many difficulties. In addition to indifference, lack of financial help and of ministerial guidance was evident. To make it doubly difficult, the Presbyterian church itself was it divided? They came for gold and nothing else, said Frank Hall in his 1889 History of Colorado. And so they did, on foot, on horseback, by wagon or ox cart, mostly on the foot and walker line, that is, they walked. Gold, that magic substance, that magic word, had struck courage into the hearts of many several years before when gold had been discovered at Central City. And now, early in 1859, gold was discovered near Gold Hill by A. A. Brookfield and others. I mention his name because he played a part in the establishment of Valmont Community Presbyterian Church. More about that later. It is not easy living here. There were Indians in the area. It had been only two months since Gettysburg in far off Pennsylvania, and the Homestead Act of 1862 allowed settlers into previously land, previously into lands previously occupied by the Indians. And the Emancipation Proclamation had gone into effect in January of that year. Some of the obstacles were physical. Earlier trading posts up and down the South Platte River had been abandoned. There were seemingly impenetrable mountains to the west. The climate was arid and the soil rocky. There were no navigable rivers, very different from what newcomers had been accustomed to in the Eastern states. Remember, as you think about what it means to come to a new area, there were no or very few roads, no railroad. 10 years in the future, there would be a railroad. And then it was a result of the development of the coal industry in Eastern Boulder County. And no ready source of supplies to meet one's daily needs. Neither were there established societal supports such as churches, schools, doctors, fraternal organizations, newspapers. People did whatever was necessary to live and yet found time to serve the church and the greater community. At least two Valmont pastors, Charles Campbell, who served from 1865 to 67, and Alanson Day, who served 1869 to 71, served as school superintendents. Campbell was also mentioned as serving as a county attorney, deputy, deputy district, district attorney, and city attorney. One family who had come in 1859 decided farming was preferable to mining. Their first crop was a field of turnips that were devoured by grasshoppers. Hail was always a possibility. From an account in the history of the Congregational Church in Boulder, of a journey made in 1863, quote, our second visit was to Boulder City, 35 miles northeast of Central City. 
It's an agricultural region covering an area of eight or nine square miles square. It is a more permanent population than that among the mountains. We discovered about 15 congregational church members, six old school Presbyterians, and a few Baptists, and one Episcopalian. <laughs> Apparently, that small number of people had been worshiping together. In 1863, those six Presbyterians organized themselves into the Boulder Valley Presbyterian Church at Mr. A. A. Brookfield's home near the junction of North and South Boulder Creeks in Boulder County, Colorado Territory. The names as they appear in this session minutes are of three couples and one man whose wife joined the church the following year at the first recorded communion service held at Wallace Grove. These six Presbyterians who bravely established a church in the Brookfield home were P.M. Housel, his wife Eliza, Mr. S.F. Reynolds, Professor A. Barker, Mrs. J.A.C. Barker, and Mr. George Chambers and Mrs. Eliza Chambers. Housel, an attorney, was the county judge. Chambers was one of the first county commissioners, a county treasurer, and in 1870, a justice of the peace. Mr. Reynolds was one of the ones who platted the town of Valmont. Services were held outdoors in a storeroom or at Housel's grist mill. The stones from this early grist mill are in the yard at the Keter property. Earlier that year, two of the six, Peter Housel and George Chambers, later elected the first ruling elders, had invited the Reverend Alanson Day to preach at Valmont. Reverend Day was a Presbyterian who had come to Denver in late 1862 and was serving there at the time. Accepting the invitation, Reverend Day preached at Valma on Monday evenings during that summer. The history of another local church mentions that these old school Presbyterians at their service in the summer of 63. Ministers of the Congregational and Methodist churches are also mentioned as preaching in Valma. As an aside, it was on George Chambers' property north of here that a sod fort was built in 1864 for settlers' protections in case of an Indian attack. Alfred A. Brookfield, mentioned earlier of Nebraska City, Nebraska, had come to the area with others in search of the gold and was one of the discoverers of the first load gold discovery near, a, near Gold Hill in January 1859. Deciding to make this area his home, this former mayor of Nebraska City returned to his, with his wife and settled in Boulder. They were six weeks on the road <coughs> from Nebraska City in far eastern northeast, in far eastern Nebraska with her prized possession, a glass window. She was one of 17 women and 200 men at a dance that Christmas Eve in Boulder. The occasion was the dedication of the first whipsawed board floor in a dance hall. Mr. Brookfield took up a ranch of 160 acres where the town of Almont now stands and was engaged in farming and stock growing until 65 when he went to Ward. He kept moving in and out of the area. In 1826, several Protestant denominations, meaning the Congregationalists, the Presbyterians, the Dutch Reformed, and associated reformed had voluntarily banded together to form the American Home Missionary Society. The objects of this society were to introduce Christian principles and institutions wherever needed, especially in the West, and secondly, to plant churches. Cooperation was a watchword in sparsely populated areas of the West. There was division dating back many years, but a plan of union was adopted between Presbyterians and Congregationalists. Locally, the two churches later became Boulder Valley Presbyterian Church, now Valmont, and the Congregational Church of Boulder Valley, now First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in Boulder. The objects of the Missionary Society were carried out by Methodists, Methodist Episcopals, Congregationalists and Presbyterians, as noted. Valmont is, was mentioned in newspaper ads of the Methodist Church having services at 11 a.m. and Presbyterian Sabbath School at 12 p.m. Early records mention communion with the Methodists. The Congregationalists moved to Boulder in 66. The Methodists moved to Longmont in 1871. 
That left Valmont Community Presbyterian Church as the only church in the Valmont area. It was the settlement across the road from this location begun in the 1880s by Thomas Jones, who had built a large house that served as a stage stop and inn. His reputation for being hospitable and his wife's cooking, I'm sure, spread. Thus, the Valmont area attracted many transients and eventually others who came to stay. Such developments led to the plotting of the Valmont town site in 1865 with named streets and alleys in designated lots and blocks. The town included three blacksmith ships, shops, two general stores, one hardware store, two hotels, a school, two churches, and offices of three doctors. There were three saloons as well. Part of a church is a building. The first church here, meaning in the Valmont area, was a 25 foot by 40 foot frame building first used for church services on March 17, 1866. Reverend Charles Campbell, Valmont pastor beginning in 1864, had helped with the building by carrying, in, carrying stone and lumber to aid the effort. The church on the corner of Maine, now Indian Road and Rannells was enlarged in 1899, incorporating parts of the original building. Additions enlarged and modernized the building over the years. That church building burned in 1979. Needed immediately was a place to hold services until or if a new building were built. Grange halls and other church locations were offered and the decision was made to meet at the Montgomery Hall located on their farm on Isabel Road. Stella May recalled that the land for the building had been sold to Showa School for Japanese farm laborers children who studied Japanese there on weekends and went to public school during the week. From a Valmont vintage forward, Carol Strickler wrote, the law served to make real to the Valmont community what we had already known in theory. The church is not a building, but a people. After the land here was donated, this current building was erected and has been in use since then. A church is also a community of believers, a people. Now, just a few items of interest. Between 72 and 1875, the session did not meet. There are no records of a minister or of any activity. Housel and Chambers had moved from Valmont and there was no lay leadership. When a stated supply minister came in 75, Prayer meetings were started by action of session. Revivals were also held. And in 1890, communion on a regular quarterly basis was begun. From 1914 to 38, there was no minister or even a stated supply minister. Finances were always a concern. Several year end reports of a balance on hand mentioned sums of less than $3. Cooperation between denominations was evident in those who served at Valmont, either students or temporary supply who were paid from the offerings. One supply minister, an ordained Nazarene minister who had affiliated with the Friends Society, was mentioned as being faithful to this church and helped to keep the doors open. He served for 23 years. One student minister later became Methodist Bishop of San Francisco and often he was driven to the church in the sidecar of a friend's motorcycle. In 1944, Andrew Hollers, Sunday School Missionary for Boulder Presbytery, supervised the development of Highlands Camp. One of his assistants was Marvel Holder. The name of the church was changed from Boulder Valley Presbyterian Church to Valmont Community United Presbyterian Church, now Valmont Community Presbyterian Church. Regular weekly offerings were begun in 1877 after monetary subscriptions to the church were insufficient to meet the needs. The congregation began to fully support the financial budget of the church in 1958. Monthly session meetings had begun in 45. The focus of this community of believers has always been outward. As their mission statement says, to be Christ's witness to the world. Valmont Presbyterian Church has supported foreign and national missions beginning in 1871 and 72, 
with a donation of $452. In 1872, $10 was given to First Presbyterian Church in Boulder. This church is 10 years older than what was First Press. Other records indicate donations to flood sufferers after a major flood in the United States. And witness does not always mean money. In the 1880s, Sunday school collections averaged about $2 a week and were designated for missionary purposes. One missionary, Alice Carpenter, a member of Valmont who had grown up in Boulder, went to Canton, China in 1922 to teach at a school for the blind. Later, she was arrested, sent to an internment camp, repatriated in 43, and returned to China, but was forced again to leave because of a communist threat. During the Second World War, gifts were sent to the children in the Japanese internment camp at Hart Mountain, Wyoming. Peter and Sue Johnson served the Navajo people at Cayenta, Arizona in 1974 and 75. Valmont supported two missionary couples, Stu and Edith Nelson, who were with Wycliffe Bible Translators, and Stu and Edith, Stephen and Donnie Ann Bird, who were with Jungle Aviation and Air Service, also a part of Wycliffe, and they are here tonight. Um, Valmont members helped build at least one home in Boulder for Habitat for Humanity, and currently some of our mission funds support Covenant Youth of Alaska. Looking back at hard times and low periods in the life of this congregation, it is still apparent that God is faithful and upholds those who believe in him. As I said, a church is also a community of believers and the history of Valmont's first hundred years, Ted James, the author mentions one believer, James Platt, who served as Sunday school superintendent for more than 40 years and an elder for 37 years. Early records mention the sad state of the church, and for some period of time, the only records for this church are those of the Sunday school. Another faithful member was Mrs. Maddie Andrus, who joined in 1905. She organized a missionary society. I've lost the paper. Um, I apologize. Um, I'll have to tell you as much as I can remember. The other person I wanted to talk about was Charlie Sawhill, who was Joy Keeter's and uh, Joy Keeter's uncle and Kathy's great uncle, who served as organist for many years until the 80s, 1980s. And he lived in Denver and never learned to drive, so he would come a long time ago on the interurban and then on bus to get here to uh, play for church. Anyway. Our next speaker talks about two other longtime members of this church, Stella Montgomery and forgotten, Joy, the Saltdale family. I apologize for my lack of paper. Hi, um, my name is Kathy Houghton Sawhill, and it is my honor on behalf of Aunt Joy to share her story that she has written. I'll forewarn you now that what I say may not match the pictures, so just to let you know that. Okay. So I start out with Uncle Charlie. That's okay. There he is. Okay. So these are Joy Keeter's words. 
My Uncle Charlie never married, never drove, but oh, how he could take pictures. He was able to have a camera with no, when no one else did or could. He went to Washington, D.C. in the 20s, and when he came back to Denver, he worked in the U.S. Post Office downtown and lived for years in the YMCA. He commuted to, to Boulder by bus every Sunday for as long as I can remember and played the organ or piano at both the old and new church. He'd come to the house where I live today for Sunday dinner. He later took back, we later took him back to the bus in the late evening. He practiced organ or piano at the church and for years had a baby grand at the house. I will never forget listening to hymns and his music. The vintage done by Carol Strickler is full of Uncle Charlie's pictures and we will go through, go through talking about those pictures and how they pertain to my life. Okay, um, more, more pictures of the church. <laughs> I think we're, we're going back here. Okay. So, okay. So could, okay. stop when you get to the melon farm. Here we go, okay, okay. So this is Aunt Joy talking. Me and my friend, Jerry Andrus, we're still lifetime friends, are in many of these pictures. Jerry was born one month after me and lived in the only house on the side of the Butte. Her grandparents lived in the house to the north of here around the curve. That little portion of road between 61st and 63rd is named Andrus Road. On that corner was a produce stand ran by Bert Andrus, and it sold melons. Any, anywhere watermelons were grown, the young boys would, would go to steal at night, probably my dad included. Um, this was a big deal and also happened at 75th and Valmont, where they also grew melons. I'm just going to go on about um, vacation Bible school. And Sunday school were a big deal. Vacation Bible School was very active in the early days of this church, and we partnered with First Presbyterian um, a few times. Uh, I should. Okay. Yeah, she doesn't have much about the town of Valmont. So I'm just going to tell a little bit more about Aunt Joy's history. Um, I was born in December 1938. I had a sister, Katie, 14 years older, and two brothers. Jean, my dad, 11 years older, and Walt, 9 years older. My mom was 40 and my dad, 46 years old, when I was born. Yes, they thought I was a spoiled brat. I had a great childhood. I rode O Jim who I remember riding also, my horse bringing in cows to milk from where they grazed across the track just east. That area was meadows, not farmed until 1946, when they began to dig gravel from the concrete plant, now Sawhill Lakes, which are located on 75th. The material was hauled to a crusher and a washing, washer plant and then hauled to Boulder on Spruce Street to a ready mix plant. And that went on until the 1960s. All the material that was hauled went between our house and Milk Barn, and the Milk Barn is still there, 
And in the heat of the summer, that's the best place to go. It's still cool in that milk barn. Um, so they hauled the material 30 to 40 tandem loads a day. In 1963, my parents sold the lakes to the State Fish and Game Department. And the lake you see here, or somewhere, <laughs> uh, here and one more on this side of the tracks were owned separately. The church lake was owned by Flatirons and had originally been on the Manchester property. And when they talk Manchester property, that's just right across the street. My folks again sold to the state in 1963 to 1964. And in 1965, my mom passed away from cancer. My dad sold the house and five acres to Buddy and me and he remarried and moved five miles north. Um, so Buddy and I were living in the little house, and that's where I live now, next to Dad and our three children, Chris, Paul, and Ben. We were already in the trucking business and running the business from our little house. We added on to the house to the north and had the office for our business there from 1966 to 1990. So I was back where I had started. Of course, the house has been remodeled and added on to many times since then. And Aunt Joy is very proud, even now, whenever she sees somebody, and with all her little doctor appointments um, lately, it's she's proud of saying, I live in the house that I grew up in. Um, okay. My dad sold us 15 acres when the, where the business is today. In 1984, he came back to live with Buddy and me. He was with us for six and a half years and what a delight he was. And I always, I'm just gonna share this little tidbit. I was always thought it was so neat that Uncle Charlie had his love for music and it was his eyesight that went, but not his hearing. And Grandpa Sahel had his love of reading and um, his hearing went, but he could see to read. So just to share that little bit. So we do enjoy those little things in life. Um, our kids are now, and I think these dates are wrong, get, so add a couple years, uh, 61, 60, and 58. The boys have their own individual businesses, but not on the business property where all the action is. My grandparents moved onto the property in 1902. And my father was born in 1896, just around the end of the butte by the ready mix plant. So on the other side of the butte, there's still a little, I think it's kind of burnt down now. But anyway, it's just right around the corner there. Uh, Buddy and I met in December 1955. And I have to share this. They met dragging main, dragging Pearl Street in Boulder. So, and their first kiss was at um, Flagstaff. Anyway, okay. <laughs> Buddy loved truck and he began our business in 1959. He really never worked for anyone else but himself, hauling anything and everything, employing 20 to 30 people depending on jobs. I worked in the office located in our home all those years. And Marlene also worked in the office with me for 15 years. And Buddy and I raised three kids who were involved in 4-H farming and sports. We now have five grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. We are truly blessed. And God is good, and I know Buddy is in God's hands and is with him now. Thank you. Okay, I think that that means that we get to go and join one another in the fellowship hall for a reception with one another. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight and sharing in some of the history of both our state and of our region. Um, I hope that this will not be the only opportunity that we get to spend with one another this weekend as tomorrow. Uh, starting at noon, uh, we are going to be joining together for a celebration and a pig roast. And we hope that you will join us uh, right back here for a time of music and games and fellowship as we celebrate not only uh, the life of this community, but also the grace of God in holding us together for all of these years. So on behalf of Almont Church, I thank you for being here, and I hope that you will join us in Fellowship Hall. <laughs>